Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, it is my great pleasure to announce Michael Stolk at our seminar. With Michael Stock, uh, our seminar goes global, in fact, because Michael is in Bielefeld in Germany. Uh, but he visited uh, Sydney a few times and he, will, he is very well known to colleagues from China and Japan. So it is still, we can say, uh, Asia Pacific seminar. Uh, <laughs> please, Michael, please, Michael, start. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy to give this talk in this uh, global seminar. I mean, it's half of the world is in, inside, and now I'm from the other half of the world and give a talk. Uh, so I've just have uh, I've just had breakfast. Uh, but so to you, I should say, I don't know, good afternoon or something. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the evolution to equilibrium of nonlinear Fokker Planck cholmography equations. <clears throat> it's a joint work with Viorel Barbu from the uh, Romanian Academy of Yash. And uh, the uh, reference, uh, uh, I put them normally in green, you see down here. And the paper that I'm talking about is this paper on archive. Uh, the other one down here, uh, I forgot to update, I realized this uh, five minutes before the talk, uh, that this has been uh, accepted by Annals of Probability. And this one has appeared in JDDS meanwhile. Okay, so now about the topic. Oh yeah, okay. So that's the contents from, uh, first of all, the first section is about the connection of nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation uh, to stochastic differential equations, which are um, also depending on the law of the solution. So these are the so-called nekin vlasov stochastic differential equations. Probably you know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, more or less, between Fokker linear Fokker-Planck equation and SDEs. Uh, and, uh, more precisely, weak solutions of SDEs. And uh, so one of uh, our latest contribution was to have now the same uh, uh, correspondence between um, uh, mckeen vlasov equation and nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. One direction this was well known, as I will explain at the moment, but in the other direction, it is a, a quite recent contribution. Okay, and then I'm going to talk about special uh, nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation, those which are no, where the coefficients are not depending on the on the laws in a we weakly continuous fashion, but uh, it, uh, much more singular fashion. And then many, many nonlinear PDEs become nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. We call this the Nemitsky case, and I will explain this. Um, and then I will uh, tell you the nonlinear analog about, of uh, what the so-called distorted Brownian motion. I know this is more an analysis seminar, but I will explain this distorted Brownian motion, the linear one and the nonlinear one from an analytic point of view, namely starting with the corresponding nonlinear Fokker-Planck cosmograph equation. And then we have the main theorem is about uh, existence of stationary solutions, and that will be in section four. Okay, so now from uh, nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation to distribution dependent SDE, and this this is really the point uh, that the uh, in this direction. So we start with the Fokker-Planck equation, and then we solve the corresponding distribution dependent SDE. But first of all, let me explain the other way around because it's easier to understand, and this was well known for many many years. So we have a stochastic differential equation of this type. So the special uh, T of this equation is that the, <clears throat> the coefficient B and sigma, so B is just a vector field time dependent on RD, but it also depends on probability measures. So it has three variables. And then, as I said, it's a vector field, so it takes values in RD. Then sigma is a function of same space, so also depends on a probability measure and takes values in the matrices. So that means the linear maps from RD to RD. And uh, so there are some conditions on the sigma, which I will uh, explain later, but it's, this is important, is just measurability assumptions, nothing more. Okay, so then look at this equation. And uh, uh, so the solution is just definition, uh, by definition, the solution of the corresponding integral equation. So xt is equal to initial condition plus an, the integral of this and then the integral of this. And this is just the usual stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion. So this is Brownian motion on RD. Okay, and the uh, L of xt is what is called the time marginal law of the process. So xt is defined on some probability space. So it's a random path. And then you fix t and you look where it is at time t. 
So that's a random point in RD and you're looking uh, for the probability law of this, uh, of this, pro of this uh, random variable. Yeah, so in analytic terms or geometric terms, it's just to push forward um, of this probability measure onto RD, and then this becomes a probability measure on RD. And it's called the time marginal law. So McKean loss of uh, stochastic differential equations, sometimes also called uh, distribution dependent SDEs. They have a long history. So uh, started with a fundamental paper of McKean in 1966 in the Proceedings of National Academy in the US, uh, where he had this vision that uh, we can easily represent solution to linear uh, PDE, so like the heat equation by as the distribution of a stochastic process, so for the heat equation would be just Brownian motion. Uh, is it also possible, and for many, many other linear uh, PDEs, one can do this, what about nonlinear PDEs? And uh, this was exactly his dream to uh, represent solutions of nonlinear PDE as time marginal laws, what I just explained, <coughs> of stochastic differential, uh, of a <coughs> stochastic process. And then there's fundamental work by Snitman and Funaki and Scholzhoff. So this was uh, 20 years later. And now me, there is a lot of papers. There are beautiful books by Carmona and Delarue and, uh, and then very, very many recent papers. I will not go through them. Uh, so if you just uh, Google, you have never uh, looked into this area, you will find really a lot of papers. Okay, but now I'm concentrating on the other direction. Uh, sorry, first of all, I want to start in a, <laughs> explain the one direction. So now suppose we have a solution of this stochastic differential equation. Yeah, so we have a process xt evolving in time. Yeah, uh, so depending on chart, ch chance. And then we, <clears throat> we look at the corresponding marginal laws and we ask the question, can we write, write down uh, an equation for these laws as measures. So that means it's an equation which has a path of measures as a solution. And uh, this is very easy by follows from Ito's formula. So uh, just applying Ito's formula, <clears throat> it is easy to find the Fokker-Planck equation uh, for the time marginal laws. So I will abbreviate this FPKE in the, what follows. So let us, because this is a clumsy notation, let us just, uh, uh, Okay, this, um, um, sorry, denoted by mu t. So t is now running. So that means this is a path of probability measures on Rd. Okay, and then we can sort of uh, by take a test function on Rd and look uh, how does this measure act on the test function. Okay, then I know the measure if I know what, what this quantity is for all t and for all test functions phi, then I know, so think of, uh, C0 infinity function or CB function is more better. So all continuous functions bounded on RD. Okay, and then you write down the equation. So this, uh, uh, sorry, the definition of the mu t, remember it's the push forward under xt of the probability measure p on this abstract probability space. So it's the same as this. So now I write the equation. xt, I told you, is like is always the solution of the corresponding integral equation. So that's the same as x0 plus, and then comes the integral of the b part. I can go back quickly, and then the integral of this other part. And uh, then I have to take still the expectation, right? I have to take this p of d of omega. So then this martingale part, sorry, this uh, stochastic integral, which is a martingale, expectation of this becomes zero. So only this survives when I do this. And then it turns out there is another part coming up from Eta's formula, the second order part, that gives you a second order part of this expression. So look at this expression, here's the second order part. So that means altogether, if you put, put in Eta's formula, then you get this uh, second term yeah, that comes from the B term and uh, the, uh, what we call the quadratic variation part of this stochastic integral, which gives you a second order part. Okay, and then we can again apply the push forward. Yeah, so we just apply this to the measure and we remember this is just mu s. So I can write it now in blue letters like this. And this is a nonlinear Fokker Planck uh, Kolmogorov equation. And this is the Kolmogorov operator. So that comes from Ito's formula and it looks like this. So it acts on this function phi, sorry here, this function phi, <coughs> like this. 
So you take the second derivative, and then Aij, which is just sigma sigma tau. So that gives you the second order part. And the sigma was the sigma in the stochastic equation. So it's non-linear because the coefficient depend on ut. Okay, so that means if you see this as a weak solution, uh, as, a, as a formulation of the weak, a weak solution of a PDE, then you can see it is not linear. It's linear here in the mu s, but not here because the coefficient depends on the measure mu t. And that's the same for the first order part. So now let us drop the test function. Uh, by the way, here, this is a reference. So we have written a book about uh, focal plan homomorphic equations that was published in 2015. You can find uh, also, it's mainly linear uh, FPKEs, but also nonlinear. So you can find also that in there. So now if we write it as uh, in the sense of Schwarz distribution, this is equ uh, equation. So that means we take away this test function here. So what do we do? We just have to uh, apply this in a dual way to the measure mu s. So you can just put this onto the measure mu s in the, with respect to the spatial integral. Then you take derivative. The fee is gone, right? Because I just uh, look at it in the weak sense. So then I have, the, if I then take the derivative again of this equation, I get the derivative of the, of the mu t, this is gone, is exactly this expression if you put this to the mu s. And then I, you can plug in the definition of the mu s and then in a concise form, this is then the nonlinear Fokker Planck equation. Uh, and mu zero is some initial conditions. And you can write it even shorter like this. So this is the usual way people write it. And uh, so that means you suppress the dependence of the coefficient on space and time, and you just stress the uh, <coughs> dependence on the coefficient on the measure. And then you, you, you see the structure, you see? So it is just a dual uh, equation to usual, um, let's say Cauchy problem, but now it's dual because you uh, put everything onto the measure. And then you can see it's of the type Aij mu mu. So that means bi mu, here's the nonlinear part, and then mu, and this comes from uh, this special form of the, of the equation. I can go back again. So you can see here, here's the mu, and here's also the mu. Here's the sort of the linear uh, part, and here is a nonlinear part com coming from the fact that the coefficients depend on the measure mu. Okay, so this is the structure of these equations. Okay, so this is a lot of equations, of course, there's a, a large class, not every equation is, is of this type, of course, but there's a large class of equations look like this. Okay, and please try to remember, so you di differentiate twice in the first, and then you have AIG mu mu, and then BI mu mu. Yeah, here's the divergence. Okay, so now let us go backwards. So now I've explained to you how do you come from a, a mckin vlasov SDE to the corresponding nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. This is for stochastic anal analysis completely trivial. It's just a E2 formula. And then you see the kind of equation the laws obey. So these paths of measures, which are the time marginal law of the process, obey. Uh, and this is the nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. Now let us go backwards. So can we do the following, solve this equation, yeah, some initial condition. Uh, suppose we can solve it. That doesn't come for free. It's very difficult to solve these equations. And then can we reconstruct the process yeah, so that it solves this equation and more precisely solves the SDE, I go again back to the SDE, in a weak sense. Yeah, so it, for probably this means we are allowed to construct a suitable Brownian motion and the process so that this uh, equation holds. And indeed, one can do this uh, in very, very general situation. There have been many results in this direction when bi and aij, these uh, coefficients, so let us look here, they de depend on mu t uh, in a continuous way with rest. So if you vary the t here, mu t varies as a measure, and then this varies then as a function of this measure. And you look at the topology on the measures, which is generated by the bounded continuous function. So that's the weak topology, so called the narrow topology. Uh, they assume continuity in, in this measure, yeah? all the papers. Uh, very few papers do not assume this, that this continues in these mu t's. And moreover, in order to solve the equation, they, they, the papers assume always the Lipschitz in the, for instance, in the Porov metric that metrizes the weak topology, uh, or even stronger, that is uh, continuous uh, with respect to the Wasserstein distance. 
Uh, sorry, uh, this is weaker, so with respect to the Vasa study. So some kind of Lipschitz continuity was always assumed on these measures. Uh, and then many, many nice examples from PDE, so like for instance, the Porous Media Equation, uh, were out of this class. They could not be handled by this. But McKean had the vision that also these guys should be handleable in this situation. They should be also belong to this class. And he said, for so instance, in his paper, he already said the Borges equation um, uh, should be inside. And this is really true and uh, can be, it can be put in the in this framework and we can construct the corresponding process and this is a simple observation we did in this paper which will now appear in uh, also probability and uh, so but meanwhile we have <laughs> improved the, the the situation i will explain you a little bit what, in, in what sense we improved it improved it so now we go the other way around we suppose yeah uh, that we have a solution so we assume this is very important now that exists a solution so, which is a, a path of measures and they are continuous with respect to the weak topology. We do not assume that the coefficients depend continuous on mu, but only that the path is weakly continuous. And that's a very important assumption, but a reasonable assumption, because if you can find, uh, or you, you take the SDE, you take the solution, then it is always has this property that if you vary T, this varies in the weak topology in a continuous way. So assume we have a solution and we assume about this solution that it has some integrability properties. Let me this one, which is written here. So somehow we assume about the solutions that they integrate the coefficients in this way after dividing by one plus x squared. Now you can say, okay, that's a funny condition. How can you find a solution? You make such a condition on such a solution. I mean, how, how can you ever check this? But it's for instance, very, very simple. If the AIJ has at most quadratic growth, in X, okay, then this is bounded. And if B has mo most uh, linear growth, yeah, then this is bounded. But the mu is a probability measure, so this will always exist. So this is always true. So for instance, in the case where the AJ is uh, most quadratic growth, uh, so which is equivalent to the sigma, let me recall the connection. So this was the connection between AIJ and sigma. So also uh, if sigma is also at most linear growth and B has at most linear growth, then this is always fulfilled from the very beginning. Okay, and here's this weak continuity assumption. So here's the theorem. And this you can find in this paper. So there was a special case, uh, no, it was already in principle in this paper, but we have done it in more conceptual form in this paper that I mentioned, which uh, now uh, is going to appear in and also probability. And this is exactly what I said. So when we have such a solution of the nonlinear for, for Kaplan equation, so we have worked quite hard to solve the equation. Let us assume we were successful in that. And uh, we have this condition. Then it follows that that we can find a Brownian motion, we can find a probability space with a filtration. I will not go into these technical details too much. And a process X, which solves this equation. Okay, again in the integral form. So XT is initial condition plus integral of this plus integral of this. And, yeah, so it solves in such a way that this mu T is the law. You see that's written here. Okay, so we can find a solution with the given, with the solution of the Fokker-Planck equation, which, which we assume to exist, it's written here, okay? So we assume that solves the nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation, then we can find the corresponding process. And the mu t is exactly the law, so L, the law of xt. That's, so now I could call it the measure q, so before it was p, so I'm sorry about this change of notation. Yeah? Okay, so we can solve the McKean loss of equation, and this only under measurability conditions. Okay, so we assume from the very beginning that these guys are measurable and now the only thing we assume only, of course, we have to work hard. We have a solution of the nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation just with this integrability condition, no continuity whatsoever. And that's very important for our examples. So just for the experts, because time is a little tight, I will just now jump over the proof. I want to, uh, uh, what it was going to tell you a little bit about the proof. What is behind, I do show quickly the next page. Uh, of course, you solve a Martingale problem. This calls for a Martingale problem, okay? But the Martingale problem is for linear operators. So what we do, we make our Kolmogorov operator linear by fixing the mu, the fixed mu, this one, which we assume to exist. We fix it in the coefficient, then becomes a linear operator. 
So then we can solve the Martingale problem for the linear operator. However, usually the Martingale problem is solved where you're given the initial law, the initial marginal law. But now we have to solve it in such a way that it has a given marginal, not only at time t equal to zero, but for all times. So it's another kind of Martingale problem with given the entire marginal law over time zero to t, we construct a corresponding uh, uh, solution to the Martingale problem with this Kolmogorov operator. This is now more, more for the probabilistic experts. This is a new view of looking at the linear, everything is linear now because I fixed the mu in the coefficients. It's a new view of the Martingale problem with given marginal laws, new in quotation marks because there is already quite an old paper of, of Tom Kurtz where he did this thing for under, of course, much more, much more stringent conditions. There's a beautiful paper by Dario Trevisan, uh, which uh, allows this. And then uh, our contribution is that uh, in the in the condition here, so by Dario assumed strong, more strongly that uh, without this, you need this uh, integrability. So we weakened this assumption and then we can solve this linear Martinga problem. And this is in this paper here. Okay, then with the appropriate Martingale, but with the appropriate uh, time marginals, and then, then we are done. I mean, then we have solved uh, uh, Martingale problem corresponding to this equation and from the Martingale problem to come to the corresponding SDE is a standard thing um, in uh, Martingale theory. So, but this was for the experts. Okay, so the, the message now of this theorem is that once you solve the nonlinear Fokker Planck, you find, a, find again the process. So in some sense we have extended the correspondence between S solutions to SD and linear Fokker Planck equation to the case of McKean Vlasov equation and the corresponding nonlinear Fokker Planck equation by this. And our contribution is really this way back, first Fokker Planck, then the SDE. The other was long, uh, known, of course, for since McKean, since 60 years. So now let me explain the Nemitsky case that widens and exploits, first of all, that we only need measurability assumption on AIJ and BI in the measure mu. So it's just a measurable function of this probability measures. We can now look at cases which people did not consider before. And we call them Nemitsky cases. So we make now the assumption that we cannot only solve the Fokker-Planck equation, with this integrability condition. And we, we also assume that we can solve it uh, uh, in such a way that this measure has a density with respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay, so just to summarize. So now we assume we have a solution to the nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. I show you also this one, a solution to this equation. So we have a path of probability measures. We assume that we can check this condition, but we also assume that mu TDX has a density with respect to Lebesgue measure. A lot of assumptions, but we can satisfy these assumptions in applications. Okay, so this is now our assumption that we in addition have this guy. So then we can look at, uh, at the following coefficients. We can look at the coefficient Aij, depending again as before on T and X and on the measure, which is now a density measure at time t and mu t. And here, the same for the bi. So we can also look at the coefficient that, uh, so, uh, so the, the coefficient that now depends on this measure, but we assume it depends on this measure in a very special way. Namely, it takes the density at this point x, okay? And of course this t, which is here, it should be the same t there. Okay, so we have some other function, aij bar, which now in the third variable depends on the reals because this is a real valued, it's positive even. So we could also put a plus here. So it depends on this measure by looking at the density at this T and this X. And the same for the B. So now it's a very singular dependence on this measure. If you think of continuity, this will never be continuous, such a coefficient with respect to the weak topology. If you change this in the weak topology, this will not hardly notice it, right? Because it is just you evaluate the density at some point. And this is, uh, we call it the Mitski type. This comes from, uh, uh, I mean, probably everybody knows this, when uh, um, this from, from PD, there's certain, um, 
linear, um, linear, linear drift switch of in the Minsky type, like for instance, reaction diffusion equations. And this is the same, exactly the same now when the function depends on the measure. We just look at not at the entire object, but the object just at a certain point, namely the same as here. Okay, so then uh, we only are given now these functions and they're still because we only need measurability, we can handle such kind of functions uh, in our uh, framework now, okay? So now uh, I want to write down the corresponding Kolmogorov operator, uh, uh, sorry, the Kolmogorov operator, which look like this, right? So here the measure dependent, I dropped the bar here for simplicity, yeah? So the measure dependence is now just on the, on the, on the density at the same point T and X and the same here. The rest is the same as before. And the corresponding mckeen vlasov equation now would, would look at the, like, like this, V T X T and here is the law of the process at time T evaluated at T and this guy, X T. And the, this U T X T is exactly the law. So it's, this is the density of the law. Okay, so this would be a bit clumsy to write xt here, so therefore I just call the density u, but it's again the corresponding mckeen lasov equation. Uh, okay, so, and this is the, would be the corresponding nonlinear for Kovlanke equation. And please remember, you, you uh, recognize that you have a, a really a nonlinear for Kovlanke equation if the coefficients are like a, i, j, u, or that times u, yeah? So there's always a product here. And here is the nonlinearity, and then a product. And that is the structure of these operators. So here's an example. And this is exactly this nonlinear distorted Brownian motion, which I would like to explain to you. <clears throat> so now let us look at this equation. So this looks already very good. You see the, ah, maybe I first of all explain the, the coefficients. Okay, so u t now means time derivative with respect to u. We are now completely in the deterministic case. We solve now a nonlinear Fokker Planck equation of a very of a particular type. There's a one half Laplacian, then is here a function beta of u plus divergence, and this is a vector field. And I will this uh, is of the following type. D is a function of x and b is a function of the reals and we evaluate it at our solution. U at time t x depends on t and x the solution and we have some initial condition. Here are the conditions, so D is a natural number, then beta goes from R to R, and it is monotone. So this is one condition, we need even more. This is just a vector field, so if I multiply this guy with this guy, then the measure dependence, which means now the density dependence is via, um, is, uh, via this B, and the spatial dependence is via the D. So we have here d of x, b of u, tx, u, tx yeah, in this term. And here now the conditions, the beta is supposed to be c1, 0 at 0, and it is uh, Lipschitz, and also non-degenerate. So, so that means that the inverse of beta is again Lipschitz. We are presently work, working on the case dropping this so that this can be 0 should be monotone the B, so B prime should be non-negative, but we want to allow this also to be zero. And this is now a new paper, which we are still, uh, still working on. B is just CB intersected C1, and then the D is a, is a nice vector field. So uh, maybe I, this condition is uh, somehow for simplicity. We need, of course, some conditions, but this is not optimal here. But this is important. D is minus Laplacian of the of phi. I'm sorry, gradient of phi. So it's a gradient of a function. Um, and it is this function phi is kind of a Laponov function that goes at infinity when x goes to infinity, bigger than one, so it should be big enough. And it should also go uh, fast enough to infinity, but not too fast. So for some power, the reciprocal should be in L1. Now you can say, well, this is not a Fokker Planck. You told us it should be coefficient u, u, yeah? But this is not. Okay, we make a trick. We just divide by u and multiply by u. Then we have bu divided by u times u. And bu divided by u uh, is well defined because of this condition, because then, in this condition, because then b of r is less or equal to constant times r. So then this is always well defined. So now here are our aijs. Yeah, aijs, here is uh, this one, and then this is the other one. 
Okay. Now let us look at the corresponding co nonlinear Kolmogorov operator. So here we have the dependence on the measure in front of the Laplacian. Yeah, we have integrated by parts so of the nonlinear coefficient appears here. And then we have a divergence becomes the gradient after integration by integrating by parts in the quotation marks. And then because it's in the sense of distribution and then the B depends on the U. So why do I call, so that's a Kolmogorov operator. Yeah, so everybody knows a special case, namely if beta is the identity, then this cancels. So we just have one half Laplacian. And if the B is constant, okay, this is constant, then we just have a drift. Okay, sometimes this operator is called the Witten Laplacian, but uh, Kolmogorov studied this about 50 years earlier in his fundamental paper in 1936 uh, about the reversibility of the laws of nature. So it's a very well uh, known operator and there's a very well known stochastic process solving an ordinary stochastic differential equation, which is the distorted Brownian motion. So now this is the sort of nonlinear analog of this. And this is the mccain vlasov equation. Now I've written instead of, U T X really the law. It becomes a little bit more complicated to write. Yeah, so this is this, and then we have this drift, which depends on the law at the point X T. Okay. So now uh, we, we we have seen or already that we once we can solve this this equation, then we can solve the corresponding stochastic equation, and then we have proved that exists a corresponding process, which is a nonlinear uh, distorted Brownian motion. So now we'll t tell you that we can actually solve this equation. Okay, and then together with the other theorem, we have that exists such a process. Okay, so, uh, well, this is an example of phi, but uh, it's not, not so important. And so how do we solve this equation? So we use nonlinear semi-loop theory. So that means we look at the operator A that appears in our, uh, I mean, in our Cauchy problem. Yeah, we are solving a Cauchy problem here just a Cauchy problem. So we look at the operator on the right hand side, we prove it is maximal accretive in L1, and then we prove it generates a, a semi-group, okay? Corresponding semi-group. You have an accretive operator, you have the resolvent, and then you uh, solve the, <coughs> and then you have the corresponding semi-group using the crandall ligand approach. Okay, so here, very quickly, because I want to tell you also about the asymptotic behavior. So very quickly, so you really prove that this operator A is accretive, which is exactly this, and it is on two, so it's ma maximal or M accretive. And furthermore, we can prove the domain is dense. We can prove that it uh, um, preserves the mass, and so the resolvent preserves the mass, so that means if, the, this is not the initial condition, now the right-hand side. Yeah, so the right-hand side of the, of the elliptic equation, giving me the resolvent. So that means it preserves uh, measure and it pre preserves uh, positivity. And then we can use the usual way. Once you have this Emma creative operator, you can solve the corresponding Cauchy problem. And this is done by this Euler type uh, approximation. I have no time to go too much into this, but then we can find the corresponding semigroup by Euler's formula. So UT is a semigroup, ST. Let me just go to the next page, and then you will see it. Here's this semigroup, ST0. And so this is kind of exponential TA. Yeah? So that's exactly as in the linear case. Uh, it has the semigroup property and uh, it is strongly continuous. It's not linear, but it is still a strict con contraction. So it's Lipschitz with uh, Lipschitz constant less than one. And this comes from this famous uh, crandall ligand uh, construction, which is uh, sort of indicated here. If you want, I can send you the slides. You can then look in more detail. And then uh, also the semi-group, because this preserves measure and preserves positivity, then this preserves measure and preserves uh, positivity. So if I apply, so this is written here. So if I apply now this UT, which is just uh, the, given by this operator, the limit of this in a strong sense, so then this semi-group um, <coughs> is a probability measure for all t, if u0 is a probability de uh, density. Yeah? Okay, and then it solves the equation. So this is a solution to the equation. Yeah? This is, uh, solves this equation, which is exactly my Fokker-Planck equation. So it's exactly, oops, sorry, this equation. Okay, this is my A, I just written it on the left-hand side.
So this is why I had to solve it. It is not at all easy, but I, because we have a porous media part and we have a first order part. So this is a, a little challenging to find this solution. But this is not our main result in this paper. Uh, we have a, uh, we, we want to prove that it has an invariant measure under certain conditions on our uh, uh, coefficients. So remember the drift in my uh, nonlinear Fokker Planck equation was given by the gradient of a function phi. You should think of phi as a, as a kind of potential or energy term. So therefore we do not only look at uh, L1, I explained to you this ST is a, is a C0 semigroup in L1 with respect to the back measure. Now we also look at L1 with respect to this weighted measure, which comes from the drift. So that is very analogous to the distorted Brownian motion, yeah, the linear one. So we do something similar in the nonlinear case. And this, uh, this uh, sort of weighted norm, which, by, which we denote by this double norm, uh, is sort of res respects the semigroup in a way, you see. It is almost also of linear growth with respect to this weighted norm, our semigroup, our solution machinery. So U0 is the initial condition of the Cauchy problem. This is the solution. Then it is almost of linear growth. However, there is this additional term. So that is the L1 norm with respect to Lebesgue measure, which causes some problems. Yeah? If this wasn't there, then I don't think it's quite easy. Just uh, keep this, uh, this in mind. Um, Okay, and then, uh, well, we, we dropped this remark, it's not important. Uh, and the, the, the theorem down here already says, so once we solve the Fokker-Planck, then by our general machinery, we also for, solve the mckeen vlasov SDE, so we uh, have constructed the non-linear distorted Brownian motion. So now we come to the asymptotic behavior. If you want to study asymptotic behaviors, you need a kind of Laponov function. Yeah, or an entropy function or energy function. There is different word, words for this. Okay, so now in what sense? Well, we have this semigroup. Look at this one here. U0 is an initial probability density or even more general, it doesn't have, can be only non-negative. But this M is, it should be integrable with respect to, uh, to this weight that I call M, uh, space of all function in L1 with respect to this weighted measure. This one, I call M. So this is what we need. This is the most important observation. Okay, so we can basically now uh, solve this, of course, one, once uh, as long as this is in L1, and then I also would like to have it in this space M. We can construct this solution. Uh, and now we would like to understand uh, what happens when T goes to infinity, because that should give us the invariant measure in this nonlinear situation. Okay, so we need to study this and then we need sort of a Laponov function of this guy. Now this is a path in L1, yeah? U0 is a probability density, so this is a probability density in L1 for every t. Okay, so it is a path in L1. So we need a Laponov function for this path. And usually when you work with measures, people look for Laponov functions, which is just a, a function and you integrate with this path and then to try to tame this path or to analyze the behavior of this path. However, this is not enough. You need, and it's well known in nonlinear situation, you need a function of this guy, not just integrated with uh, integral, integral with some function of the state space, which would then be a kind of linear Laplanoff function. You need a nonlinear Laplanoff function. And this is usually in, so in classical situation, when you just look at the heat equation, for instance, which is a special case, then this is the famous uh, Boltzmann entropy that you take. But now we are in a nonlinear situation. We need an analog of the Boltzmann entropy. And here it is. So we look at this function. So you see, we take beta prime of S divided by S B S, we integrate it, and then we integrate it again. Now think for a moment, the beta prime would be, the beta would be just the identity. So this would be one. And so, suppose the, uh, the, th this drift part, the B in the drift part, that this B that is, is, is also constant, okay? So then we would have, so we still have our other part of the drift, the D part, yeah? But this would be just a constant. So basically this would be just one over S, okay? So then this is log S, okay? So this is x log s, x. So you have entropy. 
So in the classic linear case, this is just entropy, the entropy functional. So then the corresponding Laplace function is just integral of this log log, sorry, u log u minus u to be more precise. Okay, because that's the primitive of the logarithm function. So then this would be just the classical Boltzmann entropy and this is the energy part. So therefore this is E for energy and this S for entropy. Okay, but in our case, we have to take into account that we are in a nonlinear situation. So we have a much more complicated, well, well it is more complicated, maybe not much more complicated, um, um, entropy type function. And we are not in the situation that we have re reversibility, so it's not a gradient dynamics. Yeah. So, but nevertheless, this works. So this is, uh, and then it turns out this is a Laplace function, and this eta can be estimated by our assumptions on beta prime and, and b. And for b, we need a new assumption, namely should be bounded below, away from zero. Yeah. And to handle this integral in a proper way. And then you can show this is written down here that this eta can be estimated from below by the usual. Boltzmann entropy um, and then the upper bound. So by the usual entropy again. Yeah? So we have up, upper and lower bounds and this helps us to do the analysis. Okay, so this I already explained to you that in the uh, so classical case, you go back to the Boltzmann entropy. So we're just, uh, I'm just going to, to, to skip this part, but I want to, uh, to draw your attention to this function. It's a very important function, psi of u. Uh, is, is this function. So, well, you can call it, maybe it is a, another energy behind this function. You see it's always positive, but you can see it has to do with our equation. Yeah, Because if you drop the divergence from our equation, then these parts uh, pop up, yeah? A little bit normalized, but uh, just to uh, give you some intuition about this function. Anyway, so now let us look at the limit behavior of our semi-group. So we look at the omega limit set of our solutions. So these should be, one of these guys in the limit should be our invariant distribution, our invariant measure, invariant density. So this will converge hopefully to a probability density, which will solve the stationary nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. So it should be the invariant measure for our semi-group. However, in general, one can only prove that this converges in L1 log. Under an additional condition, the so-called balance condition, we can prove it converges in L1 and then we are done. You will see this. Okay, so let's, let's just look at the omega limit sets in the L1 log. So these are also all the candidates and it turns out that they depend, normally that maybe they're in the limit, they do not, they're not in L1, but it turns out they're all in L1. Though the convergence is only in L1 log limits will be in L1. So here's the H theorem. And then I'm, this is the large, uh, last theorem today. So now we assume uh, that the our, our hypothesis holds the last, remember this was the hypothesis on the coefficient and then this additional one. So then this V that I just introduced is a Laplace function. So that means the our, our path or solution flow, if you want to call it like this, becomes smaller if you along the uh, this Laplace function. So v of a later time is less than v of an earlier time of our, our solution. Okay, uh, we need a little bit of a condition here that might puzzle you. So it's not clear whether this v is not plus infinity, but if the initial condition has finite entropy. This is equivalent to, to this guy. So we take an initial condition with finite entropy, then this is true. And then we can measure, this is a general technique, which is known from a beautiful paper by Paisy. Uh, you can sort of measure the, uh, how much it, it becomes smaller. There this function psi comes in. This function psi measures how much smaller uh, the Laplace function becomes between two times. Here's the earlier time, here's the later time, and this is, the difference that you pick up. And then this omega limit set is non-empty. Yeah. Okay, and it, it contains an object which is a zero of this function that measures the difference. So it is a zero point of this function. It's not so surprising, but I, I will show it in a moment. And then either this guy, what we get here is, uh, so it's, it's identically zero, I'm not claiming that these guys are probability densities. I'm just claiming that they're in L1. 
So either this is zero or it's strictly positive. There's a dichotomy here. And we can calculate this guy. Namely, if you look at this function, which is sort of the first part of our Lapunov function. So yeah, yeah, not Lapunov function, of this function eta. So it's this part, this, we take this g. Then this is just the inverse of this g. This g is easily shown, can be invertible, has a range which is all of r, so we can do this. Okay, we can calculate it up to a constant. And this constant determines the mass of u infinity. Yeah, so if you want to be the probability measure, you take a very particular mu, then this becomes a probability density. Okay, so this is part A. I will tell you about, about part B in a moment. So we have already candidates to be invariant measures. So at least we have already found zero points and that's important, these zero points. And that's, I will explain very quickly. You see, if you now take this function and apply it to this U infinity, which we find in this theorem, this guy in the omega limit set, if you apply it to this function, it's this, then this means that this in inside here is zero, you agree? Yeah, integral is zero, positive function, so this must be zero almost surely. Okay, so then this must be true. We are just multiply through by this guy, so then you get this guy without the square, okay, and then you, or you divide by this guy. So you get the grad phi, and here you just get this divided without the square. And the plus should be zero, so this is minus grad phi. Everything is in H1, so it, or let's say W11. Okay, so then if we can write this as a gradient of something, we get something from this equation. But it is just a gradient of this guy, just by chain rule. Yeah? Take the derivative of this, okay? So this gives you <coughs> this grad u, and then you just get the inside applied at this, just by the chain rule. Okay, so this is the same as this. So therefore we have two gradients here, they are supposed to be equal. So that means these guys can only differ by a constant. This is, got, this is exactly our function g here applied to u infinity. So it follows that this guy is the same as this guy up to a sign and a constant. So we get this formula that was a bit magic before, but it's not magic, it's easy. Okay, now the second part and then I stop. So now we need this balance condition. So remember this gamma one was the Lipschitz constant of the beta. So it me measures sort of the, the largeness of the beta in some sense. And then it me measures the second order part because the equation was Laplace beta of u. Okay, so this measures the largeness of the diffusion of my distorted Brownian motion. And this is sort of the largeness of the drift. And the drift must be strong enough to kill the diffusion, otherwise you cannot hope for an invariant measure in the limit. So this balance condition, under this balance condition, we can prove that the omega limit set in L log one, uh, in L one log is the same as in L one. And then it follows, we have uniqueness. So the omega limit set with respect to L one norm is the same as the one L log norm, and is our, our guy U infinity, which is a zero of our psi, and then this guy can be calculated like this and is uniquely determined to the initial mass of this. So if this is a probability law, the initial, and this guy also is a probability law, okay? And then mu is the unique number that determines the mass, as I already told you, it must be the same as u zero because uh, the dynamics preserves the mass. And then as you imagine, uh, we also have that is an invariant it must be by definition, yeah, this omega limit set, if it's only one point must be invariant our, our ST. So like in the linear case, this invariant measure is invariant under ST and it solves the uh, st uh, stationary nonlinear Fokker Planck equation. And this is the last thing we look at. So this U infinity solves this equation. Solves this equation. Uh, without this guy. So we have that this is equal to zero. It's the stationary nonlinear Fokker Planck equation. And it turns out that then one can prove that the nonlinear uh, distorted Brownian motion is a weak, is a weak solution of the mccain of that we know, but it's a unique weak solution. So it's unique in law. And also uh, the uh, stationary measure or the invariant measure of this distorted, distorted Brownian motion is unique. And uh, I think this is enough for today. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Michael, for a fascinating talk. And now it's time for questions. <laughs> Any questions? No? I have a question, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? So, uh, Michael, is your uh, Lyapunov function actually a strict Lyapunov function? Uh, it depends on the definition. <laughs> so, when so uh, what do you mean by strict Lyapunov function? I mean, that as soon as the, the energy becomes constant, uh, then, no, yeah, becomes zero, then the solution must be uh, a stationary point. Um, I think in our case, it doesn't become zero, this energy. I see. Um, but this is an interesting question because we are now interested, as I told you, for uh, uh, betas which are no longer non-degenerate. Uh, so that means the inverse of beta is no, no longer a Lipschitz function. And then maybe these things can, can happen. But one has to be careful because, for instance, for porous media on a bounded domain, this is on the whole domain, yeah? Porous media on a bound domain, the, uh, the domain for certain betas, not our betas, but for instance, uh, more singular betas, uh, they get extinct. So they just yeah. vanish yeah, yeah. after a while. And I think there is a connection with your question with a, exactly these phenomena, but this uh, we have not studied yet. You see this condition here, it was difficult to find this condition, I must admit. This one just uh, helps that there is a balance between the diffusion part of the distorted Brownian motion and the drift part. Yeah? I, I go back to the SDE, then you see immediately this connection. Yeah. It's like in the linear case basically, but here, you see? So now this is the diffusion part. And in order to have an invariant measure, so this must be strong enough to, at the end, uh, press down the fluctuations, so to speak, yeah? to have a limit at least for the law, for the marginal laws. And this is a, is a balance between this guy and, and this guy and, and this guy, because the beta, the strength is measured by this gamma one, which was the Lipschitz constant of the beta. So, uh, so I think I, I consider this paper as a very, very first step to study such questions in nonlinear situations. So yeah, there's a lot to do, I think. Uh, so the betas which you are considering, are, if they are looking for power function, like u in the power of m, then m must be larger than one, yeah. strictly larger than one. Uh, even, uh, you see, this is a uh, slip sheet. So that means no, uh, if you just think of power function, we can only do the identity. Yeah. Right, but there are of course many functions that uh, they satisfy this this condition. Yeah, but this kind of a uh, ellipticity condition. Yeah, for the nonlinear problem, this one oh, yeah. the gamma is there. Oh, no. Okay, but if you would take uh, initial data, which are you must have a certain regularization arg um, effect of the solution of the parabolic solution. So, but if you assume that the initial data is, for instance, in L infinity. Then mm -hmm. you and then you and beta, beta would be a power function. Then it would be that's yes. okay, D definitely yes. So that means depends on the initial condition, definitely. But these questions we do not study in this paper. Here we were just interested in the in the long time behavior. But in another paper, that exactly we take the what, what is called the the Parnalion's initial conditions, which are in L one and in L infinity, and then since uh, things are much easier because then you have a regularization effect, so they stay, the solutions stay bounded, yeah? And then of course you can take betas which have a power, yeah? Because the, this is, uh, because th this is more, is fulfilled, yeah? Because you know, yeah, they're, they're bounded. Anyway, so these are, but this is uh, questions concerning existence and I can make a little bit of advertisement. We have a, line, uh, a recent paper where we st study these regularization effects. We can even start with a measure. So this U0 doesn't have to be an L1, um, function. So we can also start with a bounded measure, so measure of bounded variation. And then there are very famous uh, theorems, if this guy is zero for the porous media equation, um, that the solution becomes uh, immediately bounded. Yeah. So these are uh, uh, famous results of people, of course, Michel Pierre and other people, Veron um, and Benilon, for instance, uh, they, they uh, did this. And we have an analog of this now if we have such a drift. So uh, 
so a transport term may be the better word. And we extended these uh, results on measure initial data and regularization effects. So that means Im immediately L infinity smoothing, L1, L infinity smooth, smoothing in quotation marks uh, to such kind of equations. But in that case, it's very, uh, there we can also, uh, of course, take beta to be like classical porous media. So a power of the function U. Um, so that is possible, but in that general situation, we have wonderful existence, regularization, but we have so far no results about stationary distributions, because then this is, is degenerate, yeah, and then it is difficult to counteract the diffusion part here by a first order part. Uh, so far, we have not understood how to do this in a proper way. We can only do it at the moment for the elliptic case. Uh, yes, I, I see that. I also have a question related to the ellipsis assumption. Ellipsis assumption because uh, the ellipsis assumption for beta is, is locally related to the assumption I in page seven of the your assumption about integration of a i j over uh, one plus x squared. Less right, than so, infinity. That, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, is that so related the, to the ellipsis? Assumption for beta. So this, uh, yes, if, this you, if you look 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 at this, yeah, uh, to check it, yeah, this is related to this beta that it is uh, it is um, that the beta is Lipschitz. Yeah, it's cl clear because the AIJ was beta divide so beta of this of R divided by R, right? And then of mm. course it, it becomes uh, very very nice in that case mm. it's bounded, yeah. So that's then this is always fulfilled. However, if we are uh, prepared to to restrict our initial condition exactly uh, as Daniel said, if we restrict them, then we can drop this condition. So in this paper that I mentioned in the SIAM journal, um, I'm sorry, I just have to find it, it was after that. This one, this this one, there we exactly only look at the, the, the initial condition in L1 intersected L infinity, and then we do not need beta to be Lipschitz. Yeah? So then we can take yeah, the usual, um, polynomials and so on. This is contained in, in that paper. However, in the proof in page 21, I think that you uh, relied on the, the, the condition that uh, beta does is about it above and below strictly a lot. So, so first of all, this is on the drift. And then, as I said, we, we have a result without this. Um, um, yeah, seen, seen by one. Uh, and yeah, then what is the main point is, oops, sorry, this one, you see? That's exactly the balance condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there we, we, we have to know how big is the noise in probabilistic language. So how big is the second order part in comparison with the first order part? Yeah, otherwise you cannot expect that there are counter examples. I mean, just take, a, a, for instance, heat equation. If you have no bounds on the initial condition, then uh, of course this, uh, this doesn't have an invariant measure, which is on stationary measure, which is a probability measure. The only stationary measure is Lebesgue measure. It doesn't mm -hmm. have, uh, it's not the probability density. So you need some conditions between the second and the, uh, the first order part, like in the linear case. And this is uh, some sense the, the, uh, it's not, the, I don't think it's the best condition, but at least under this condition it works. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Perhaps I will ask a question. If we start from stochastic differential equation, can you prove uniqueness of invariant measure? without uh, studying uh, Fokker-Planck equation? This is uh, basically impossible because you see, if you, if you, uh, let, let, let's just look at this distorted Brownian motion. So in order to prove uniqueness, you need some sort of, uh, let's say, for instance, Lipschitz property on the B. Otherwise, if you take the difference, right, how do you want to estimate? Yeah, if you take two solutions, how do you want to estimate? Uh, therefore, I said uh, in uh, mo most of the paper, almost all of the papers, uh, people assume, 
Yeah, people assume that this B is uh, Lipschitz with respect for, to, for instance, Wasserstein distance on the meshes on the sigma as well. And then you can mm -hmm. prove very easily uniqueness for the stochastic equation, even pathwise uniqueness. We only need weak, weak uniqueness, right? To get the weak uniqueness of the, of the Fokker-Planck equation. Um, but uh, otherwise it's uh, in order to prove weak uniqueness of such equations. Also then people use always that this is continuous with respect to the, um, the B is continuous, sigma is continuous with respect respect to the weak topology. But in our case, this is also not the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so therefore the weak uniqueness, we found a technique to prove this, and this is in a recent paper with uh, Feng Yu Wang and Pampang Ren, where we show uh, how can you get weak uniqueness also for this very singular equations, where you have Nemitsky type dependence. Um, but it is, uh, it is very hard, and so, so far we always need the non-degenerate condition on the B. So we heavily need this condition, but this is bigger than some gamma, otherwise we cannot uh, prove. We have one example, the porous, uh, one example where we can drop it, but this is uh, what, uh, what I'm just writing up. So we have to wait maybe a few weeks and then you can find an archive. Also such a case, but it's usually very, very difficult to prove this uh, weak uniqueness for the stochastic equation when in, in these Nemitsky type situations. Yeah. And you see, it's very important that we have Nemitsky type, otherwise this equation would not be of that type. Yeah, the beta depends on on this by evaluating the law at time tx. Otherwise, these PDEs do not belong to this class. So the main step is to go to the Numitsky situation in order to cover this equation in this framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? And I have a last question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Just one short one. So it seems to me um, that one could maybe also, but please correct me here, use the Wasserstein approach completely from the scratch. So, uh, and then later you want conversion and a one, which is uh, very strong, you could maybe use Caesar Kobeck inequality. And uh, mm -hmm. then you would maybe probably get the same type of conversions which you got. So if you just go to the abstract theory of gradient flows in metric spaces, I can imagine that your uh, Nemitsky type NLFPKE does have a solution and uh, then uh, you can use um, the stability analysis which ex exists in the literature to maybe prove this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a, a doubt about that because these are not gradient systems. Okay. Because of the... <laughs> I think if you look at some special cases, I'm, I'm, uh, I can imagine that this, uh, this might work. Um, but uh, uh, one has to check, of course, the details. But in our case, because it's not gradient system, this becomes, because of this B, it is not a gradient system. Because uh, if you had this special case that you, uh, you have in the uh, Brownian motion case, just a moment here, in the special, when this, this is not there, then it's gradient, because this is a gradient of something, and this is gradient system. And this, no, this is a gradient guy and then if this doesn't if this guy is not there then it's, it's a gradient system then probably you can do something in this in this uh, using the general machinery mm -hmm. i see thank you mm -hmm. any other questions uh, if not then we should close this meeting but uh, uh, till now everyone should have received a new address zoom address to connect to our uh, coffee break say when we can ask more questions and we can discuss and talk so everyone is invited to coffee break thank you uh, just a moment the zoom address the, the, the for the for the second session uh, what is it did you send it to me daniel Yes, I did. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is to you as well. Can you check? Uh, just a second. I'm pretty sure I entered your email. <laughs> uh, okay, then I'm sure I have it. Otherwise, I sent you an email. Okay. Yeah, at four thirty, okay. I send it to you. Probably you got several other emails, but at four thirty, you should have got it. Okay. I, I check it. Okay, and then it is in uh, 15 minutes, right? No, it starts now. Just you now, go. already. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then I go to the other one. Okay. Uh, but Michael, if you want to get a coffee, go and get a grab of coffee. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, it's on you. <laughs> 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 okay, see you in a moment. Yeah, thank you. Bye. So, bye bye. bye.